Uh, so, so today we have the pleasure of having Jamie Law Smith. Jamie is, um, as most of you know, um, a new ITC fellow this year. Um, um, so we had the pleasure of seeing each other in person as well as you know here here on Zoom and um, and. Uh, before that, Jamie was doing his PhD in, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he worked with Enrico Ramirez Ruiz. Um, and uh, yeah, Jamie, take it away. Um, so again, for format, we will have like the first 20, 25 minutes, Jamie will uh, give us an overview of what you know, he's been thinking about, and then we'll have uh, time for a little bit more extended discussion. So wonderful. And then um, on a logistical note, uh, I just wanted to mention that this Zoom call doesn't automatically mute um, folks as you log in. Um, so if, uh, if you could go ahead and mute if you're um, not trying to speak up right now, um, that'll, that'll be ideal. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Jamie, take it away. Thanks, Morgan. Okay. So... There we go. So hi, so I'm Jamie Law Smith, uh, and I'm very excited to be at the CFA. Uh, so I'm actually not at the CFA right now. I'm in Chicago, but uh, my, so, so my office is P228, uh, and I'm very excited to, to talk science with, with all of you while I'm here. So I'm going to talk about interactions between black holes, stars, and galaxies. And today, I'll be talking about one particular interaction, which is that between a supermassive black hole and a star. And I'll also relate this to the galaxy in which it occurs. So this diagram here is a tidal disruption of a star by a supermassive black hole. Uh, so first, a few words about myself, as I think this colloquium is a bit of an opportunity to introduce myself to the community here. So my approach is to use stellar interactions at different scales to understand the nature of black holes, the lives and deaths of stars, and the dynamics in galactic centers. So in theoretical physics, I'm interested in understanding the sitter space in theories of quantum gravity, such as string theory. So this schematic uh, shows the interactions I study at an increasing physical scale from left to right. So at the solar radius scale, I study interactions between two stars, particularly in the context of gravitational wave sources. At the AU scale, I study interactions between a star and a supermassive black hole. At the parsec scale, I study AGN disks with embedded stars. So I'm interested in both the structure of the disk and the final outcome of the stars, in particular gravitational wave sources in these disks. At the kiloparsec scale, I study the host galaxies of these interactions. So I'm interested in angular momentum transport in galactic centers and relating stellar scale processes with galaxy scale physics and global galaxy properties. And at cosmological scales, I'm interested in understanding the sitter space in the context of dark energy and theories of quantum gravity, such as string theory. So I'm very excited to connect this program to astrophysical data. So in this talk, I'll focus on just one of these interactions, which is that between a star and a supermassive black hole. And I'll also say a few things about the host galaxy of this interaction. So I also like this way of thinking about the different structures that one can study. So here I'm showing binding energy on the y-axis versus mass on the x-axis. And you can see density is, uh, lines of constant density are indicated by these dashed lines on the diagonals. So in astrophysics, we like to study gravitational structures. These are the ones that are interesting. Um, and I've just uh, put in red uh, some of the different uh, objects that I think about. Okay, so let's talk about an interaction between a star and a supermassive black hole. So on the left is the Milky Way plus stellar motions from Gaia. 
And we think that in the centers of most galaxies, there's a massive black hole. On the right, if we zoom in by a factor of a thousand, surrounding this black hole is a dense system of stars. So this is a view of our own galaxy's nuclear star cluster in the infrared. So let's zoom in another factor of a thousand. And this is a beautiful video from the UCLA uh, Galactic Center group. And the stars in these systems trace out a complicated orbit under the combined influence of other stars and the black hole. So the stars undergo a random walk in angular momentum space through scatterings with other stars. And every once in a while, an encounter with another star will send a star onto a nearly radial, it's called loss cone orbit that brings it very close to the central black hole. And when this happens, so here we're zooming in another factor of a thousand. So this is the star on the left and the black hole in the center. So a star on one of these loss cone orbits will pass close enough to the black hole that it is ripped apart by the black hole's tidal field. So this is a tidal disruption event or a TDE. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So this is a new simulation that I developed of TDE disk formation. So following the star from initial approach and disruption to return of the debris to the black hole and the formation of an accretion disk. Uh, so for the aficionados here, the, the dissipation here is from the nozzle shock at Perry Center. It's similar to the Loeb and Ulmer uh, 1997 process. Um, and actually, interestingly, so fun fact, TDs were first proposed uh, by Wheeler um, or uh, in, this, in this conference note to physicist X, uh, which we think is Feynman, as a way to trigger uh, the disintegrational Penrose process, which is a process where energy is extracted from a black hole. Um, and they thought that this would uh, power the transient that we see. So TDEs do not work like this. Uh, we think that uh, the transient is, inst is instead accretion powered or, or powered by gas interactions. Okay, so let's spend a little bit of time understanding basic tidal disruption theory. So a star is disrupted when the tidal force across it overcomes its binding energy or its self-gravity. So this leads to a definition of the tidal radius, which depends on the mass of the black hole and the structure of the star. So another way to think about the tidal radius is if you spread the black hole over the tidal radius, the average density is the same as the star. Okay. So we'll define beta, uh, the impact parameter, as the ratio of the tidal radius to the pericenter distance. So higher beta is closer to the black hole. In this example is a grazing encounter of beta of order unity. So the star approaches on a parabolic orbit in roughly parabolic orbit in hydrostatic equilibrium. And it develops a quadrupole distortion as it passes through pericenter. And it's the associated torques that lead to large surface velocities and uh, eventually break up the star. So the star does not have time to react. So a nice fact is that in a TDE, the passage time is approximately equal to the dynamical time of the star. So here's this kind of order of magnitude uh, derivation there in the center where you can really nicely relate the passage time uh, to, uh, to the actual, to the average density of the star, which is uh, of course related to the dynamical time of the star. And the energy required to tear the star apart is supplied by the orbital energy, uh, which at the, tidal, at, the, at the tidal radius is greater than the binding energy by a factor of ratio of the black hole mass to the stellar mass to the two thirds. Okay, so the center of mass is in a parabolic orbit. And uh, in a typical tidal disruption, roughly half of the debris becomes unbound from the system and half becomes bound to the black hole. And there's often a surviving remnant. So the bound debris falls back towards the black hole and becomes the tidal disruption flare that we see. And it's the rate of return of this bound material to the black hole or the mass fallback rate that directly informs the light we see in a tidal disruption event. 
So when a tidal disruption happens, we see a rapid increase in brightness followed by a slower decay that coincides with the nucleus of the galaxy. This occurs on timescales of days to weeks. So through a detailed theoretical understanding of disruption itself, coupled with a comparison to well-sampled observations, we can learn about the properties of the disruption. So black hole properties, such as its mass and spin, and stellar properties, such as stellar masses and ages. We can also probe accretion or AGN and jet physics on a timescale of weeks. And second, through the relative rates and demographics of tidal disruptions, we can learn about galaxy properties. So stellar populations in galactic nuclei and the dynamical mechanisms operating in galactic centers. So both of these are important. So for example, when we were first beginning to understand supernovae, the light curves all looked pretty similar. And it took an understanding of both the individual events and their birthplaces in order to understand the different mechanisms the core collapse versus thermonuclear. So our current understanding of black holes is biased toward the most massive ones because these live in the biggest galaxies with the largest velocity dispersions. So here I'm showing the M sigma relationship uh, and the red box is roughly the black hole masses that TEs probe. And here I'm showing the black hole mass function. So in the local universe for every active black hole, which is the lower green line here, there are approximately 170 quiescent black holes. So that's scaled up to this upper uh, green line. Yeah. So most local supermassive black holes are quiescent and tidal disruptions are a really nice way to probe these black holes. And again, the red box is roughly the black hole masses that TDEs probe. So we can really investigate the black hole mass function with tidal disruptions. And in the last 10 years, the number of TDE detections has increased sixfold. So we're in the midst of a data explosion in TDEs, and it's very exciting. So we have well sampled photometry and spectroscopy for roughly 30 TDEs, and we expect tens of thousands of TDEs with Rubin. So I'm just showing a few examples of the beautiful data we're now getting with TDEs. Okay, so, but what can we do with all of this information? So one gets a very good fit to the optical UV light curves by directly using the results from our simulations. That is the mass fallback rate from our simulations, which I'll show in a little bit. So on the left, I'm showing fits to the light curves for a few example TDEs. And this, these fits allow us to constrain the black hole mass, so the supermassive black hole mass and many other properties. So on the right, I'm showing fits to several of these properties. And I'll just highlight black hole mass in the last column. Uh, and we can actually measure black hole masses um, better than the M sigma relation. So the typical uncertainty on black hole mass determinations is of order 0.3 dex. Okay, so with the goal of extracting as many physical parameters as possible from each observed event, uh, we've developed over several years this STARS library. So stellar TDEs with abundances and realistic structures. And TDE again is tidal disruption event. So we build STARS in MESA and we calculate their disruption in FLASH, which is a 3D adaptive mesh Eulerian hydrodynamics code. So we have accurate stellar structures. We can track the composition of the gas for an arbitrary number of elements. And we use an, uh, an extended Helmholtz equation of state. So here's a visualization of one of my simulations. Uh, so on the top right, you'll see the orbit of the star. And here we're in the frame of the star, zoomed in on the star as we pass pericenter. So you'll see tidal tails develop. But here, this uh, visualization just focuses on the surviving remnant. Okay, so here's an example of those tidal tails and the stratified uh, density structure of the debris. So I wanna point out that the stellar structure is imprinted on the spread and binding energy of the debris, which determines the mass fallback rate to the black hole 
which is then directly related to the luminosity uh, evolution of the, of the transient, the light curve. So the stellar structure has a direct relation to the light curve that we see in tidal disruptions, which is really nice. So in this STARS library, we study the entire parameter space of main sequence stellar structures. So in stellar mass, in stellar age, um, and also in impact parameters, so distance to the black hole. So here I'm showing mass fallback rates to the black hole. So mass return to pericenter, which is related directly to the light curve in a TDE um, and from simulation. So each panel here is a different stellar mass and stellar age. So each panel is a different star and the different lines are different impact parameters or distances to the black hole. So we interpolate in three dimensions. So in stellar mass, stellar age, and distance to the black hole to provide the fallback rate for any encounter between a star and a supermassive black hole using this GitHub tool. And I found that all of our simulations can be reduced to a single relationship that depends only on stellar structure characterized by this single parameter alpha, which is a ratio of the central density of the star to the average density of the star to the one third. So we essentially characterize the stellar structure or the de stellar density profile by this single parameter. And there's actually quite a good one-to-one -one mapping between these. And this allows us to reduce um, all of these simulations of different stars, different ages, and, and different distances to the black hole into single relationships, just scale with stellar structure and distance to the black hole be characterized by beta. So I'll just name some of these different uh, quantities that I'm plotting here. So on the top is the unbound mass from the star, which is related to the total energy of the transient. In the middle is the power law decay index, which is related to the power law decay of the light curve. And the bottom is the peak mass fallback rate, which is related to the peak luminosity. Okay, so another important con uh, component of these simulations is that we have the composition of the gas. And so the star's initial composition profile is mapped via the hydrodynamics of the encounter to the composition of the fallback material as a function of time. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing 2D slices of the mass fractions of helium along the top and carbon along the bottom at two different times. So left is time equals zero, right is a few dynamical times after pericenter. And this is for a one solar mass terminal age main sequence star. So you can see the helium enhancement and the carbon depletion in the star's core are spread into the tidal tails. And this results in compositional anomalies in the fallback material. So on the right this is what I'm showing. So these compositional anomalies appear before or at the time of peak fallback rate. So when the event is brightest. So the x-axis here is time over time of peak, which you can think of as when the event is brightest. And you can see compositional anomalies appear um, when this, this is of order one near peak. And the, the, the y-axis is, is, is composition. So we find uh, enhancements in nitrogen and helium at peak and depletions in carbon. So these kind of things are exciting because nitrogen and other metal lines have been observed in tidal disruption event spectra. Um, and I'll just also mention that with a student, we've developed an analytic framework for the composition of the fallback material. So to allow for a large inexpensive parameter space study that we can then tune to the simulations. So how does this fallback material actually turn into the light and spectra we see in a tidal disruption event? So I'll just show this is some work we're doing in this direction. So I showed you in the beginning a simulation of tidal disruption event disk formation, and we have the chemical abundance information for all of this gas. So here I'm showing the chemical structure of the debris and the chemical uh, structure of a TDE disk. So in white is hydrogen, red is helium, blue is carbon, and green is nitrogen. So we see this distinctly stratified uh, chemical structure. And combined with radiative transfer calculations, this will allow us to connect actual hydrodynamical structures to observed spectral lines. 
So now let's just step back a little bit and think about the phase space of tidal disruption. So here we're comparing the tidal radius um, to the Schwarzschild radius, so really the innermost bound circular orbit of the black hole. So for a 10 to the six solar mass black hole, a typical white dwarf is too dense. And so it's disrupted inside the horizon of the black hole. And main sequence and evolved stars can be disrupted outside. So for a 10 to the eight solar mass black hole, most main sequence stars are swallowed whole before being disrupted. And only evolved stars will be disrupted outside the horizon. And for a smaller black hole, a white dwarf can be disrupted outside the horizon. So, and also for the same mass black hole, each of these objects leads to very different tidal disruption flares and different signatures. So this leads to this idea and this, this plot is uh, what I've called the tidal disruption menu. So the X axis is the mass of the black hole and the Y axis is the mass of the object being disrupted. So the boundaries here are using the mass radius relationships of each of these objects and comparing the tidal radius to the innermost bound circular orbit. So the story here is that one needs different objects in order to probe different mass black holes. So denser, denser objects like white dwarfs probe less massive black holes, whereas more tenuous objects like evolved stars probe more massive black holes. And these objects, as I mentioned, all have different observational signatures and their flares span many orders of magnitude in luminosity and time scale. So we'll be using realistic models of all of these objects in order to understand the population of tens of thousands of TDEs we expect with them. Okay. So now I'll turn to the host galaxies. So we've conducted this systematic study of TDE host galaxies in the context of galaxies in the local universe. I'll just highlight a few of the results. So TDE host galaxies appear to be overrepresented in rare post-starburst or E plus A or quiescent Balmer strong galaxies. So these are galaxies where there's little ongoing star formation, which is the Y axis here, but the stars are young, which is the X axis here. So you can see the, so the points here are tidal disruption event host galaxies. The contours are reference catalog of SDSS galaxies and tidal disruption event host galaxies are overrepresented in this rare region of parameter space. So a natural question is, can we explain this with selection effects? And the answer turns out to be only partially. So there's something, we think there's something physically going on here. So in another galaxy evolution context, TDE hosts appear to live in a transition region in galaxy transformation. So the green valley between star forming spiral like galaxies, you can see the, the star forming main sequence in blue there and quiescent ellipticals. Um, so they're here just degrees of quiescence uh, indicated by the different lines. And in general, TDE host galaxies live in this green valley in this transition region. So we also found that TDE host galaxies have more centrally concentrated light profiles for their black hole masses. So irrespective of the, any E plus A classification. So on the left, I'm showing uh, just a, a diagram of what CERSIC index is here. So higher CERSIC index is more centrally concentrated light profile. And on the right, I'm showing CERSIC index versus black hole mass um, for TDE hosts. Uh, which are the points and a reference catalog of SDSS galaxy, which XDSS galaxies, which are the contours. So this could be a physical explanation for why TDEs occur in these galaxies. So there are higher, there could be higher stellar densities, which leads to a higher rate of two-body interactions and thus a higher TDE rate. And you can see this higher uh, central concentration visually. So for each TDE host galaxy here, which are along the top panels, I'm showing a random SDSS galaxy along the bottom panels, which is matched on redshift and stellar mass, but with the median CERSIC index of galaxies at that stellar mass. So TD host galaxies are highly centrally concentrated. 
And there's a story here um, in, uh, in, 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 in the galaxy evolution context uh, that, that I can go into more detail if you're interested. Okay. So now I'll just spend a few minutes discussing the work uh, I plan to do in the next few years at the ITC. So one thing is to develop this TDE machine uh, where we have end-to-end um, -end modeling of tidal disruptions using this numerical ecosystem of different tools. So starting with, with stellar models to 3D hydrodynamics um, of the disruption and then disk formation. And the gas uh, will predict light curves and the, the, the chemical information will predict spectra. And then we can use these to constrain all of the properties in a given uh, tidal disruption event and make fits. So the theoretical dream is a deterministic model predicting light curves and spectra from a handful, handful of input variables. So black hole mass and black hole spin, inclination um, and stellar properties, for example. And as I said, so, so Ruben, the estimates are Ruben will discover 50,000 TDEs and E. Rosita will discover 10,000 TDEs. And then of course we'll have JWST and GMT uh, to follow up uh, these events in their host galaxies to sub arc second precision um, at one, to, one or two microns. So the galaxy matching framework I showed earlier is general and it can be applied to the host galaxies of any transient or any type of galaxy. So I won't describe these results here, but just as an example in work led by Sierra Dodd, uh, we've recently applied this framework to try to understand changing look AGN. And I'm excited to apply this framework to the host galaxies of other transients, and in particular, those of gravitational wave sources. Okay, so turning to interactions between two stars, we're gonna make use of this capability we've developed for zoom in simulations. So much like the cosmological zoom-in simulations that study the large-scale structure of the universe down to the structure of galaxies, but here for stars. So this will help address this physical scale problem in hydrodynamical model modeling, where there are different, very disparate physical scales of interest um, in, in an interaction between two stars. So another exciting thing is combining different approaches that are most useful over different timescales. So this will help address this temporal scale problem in hydrodynamical modeling. So this is a schematic of an approach we've used recently to model the formation of a binary neutron star. So starting with 1D stellar evolution to using 2D methods, so informed by coefficients from a different study, uh, to 3D hydrodynamics for the rapid dynamical evolution, and then back to 1D for long-term evolution. So using a combination of approaches uh, to model the system from end to end. And uh, so in addition to this TDE machine, with, with some of this machinery, I, I'd like to, with some of this technology, I'd like to build this gravitational wave progenitor machine. So I'll use this framework to study star-star interactions leading to gravitational wave sources. So here I'm showing common envelope ejection leading to a binary neutron star. So on the left is gas density. In the center is velocity relative to escape velocity. And the right is binding energy. So we're seeing the neut a neutron star sweep through the envelope of a red giant here, which will eventually lead to a binary neutron star that will merge via gravitational waves within a Hubble time. Okay, so I'm also thinking about stellar interactions embedded in AGN disks. So this is a schematic of a model we're building of the structure of AGN disks with embedded stars. So this is really exciting. Um, these, uh, these stars can be formed in situ or dynamically captured. Uh, and you get a, a lot of nice physics here um, from stars to disks. Uh, so as I said, I'm interested in the structure of the disk and the final outcomes of these stars. Uh, and I, and I can, we can extend this model in this program to predict gravitational wave sources in these disks. So it may be that a large fraction of the current and future population of gravitational wave sources 
originate in AGN disks. And this is actually a promising method to do gravitational wave cosmology when it's just uh, mergers of two black holes. Okay, so in theoretical physics, I'm interested in understanding the sitter space in theories of quantum gravity, such as string theory. So the presently observed dark energy is consistent with a de Sitter solution of Einstein's equations. So shortly after the Big Bang as well, the universe also likely went through a period of exponential expansion. So de Sitter space plays an important role in understanding our present and past universe. So however, it may not be possible to construct a sitter space in our current understanding of theories of quantum gravity. So this has implications for understanding inflation and the nature of dark energy and string theory as a theory of quantum gravity. So on the right is a diagram of metastable de Sitter space. So we may currently live in a de Sitter minimum, uh, but it's likely that this is only metastable. Okay, so I'll just end here with this schematic of the different things that I think about. And th thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording.